the Joe Rogan experience. For anybody who's interested, what is the name of that video that you put out? I think it's the ancient structure, like it's said to be greater than the pyramids. I try to tease it a little bit, yes. but it's 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 on that it's on my channel. I mean, well, it's, it was a good tease. You got me. Thank you. <laughs> I, I dove right in, and I, I remember I was in the gym while I was watching it, and I, I literally stopped working out. I was like, okay, I got to pause this because <laughs> this is not something that I can consume while I'm working out. I need to like really pay attention to this because it's so wild. Yeah, and and I I honestly that I'm grateful for how like that video took off. Like it for me, it took off the way bigger than than ones that i've done in the past i talked about the labyrinth in the past and it's it's a much longer video and uh i was i was really glad to get the chance to dive into these details because i've been wanting to revisit the labyrinth for a long time however there's just been recently a bunch of new data that came up about things that happened a decade or two ago or in yeah inside the last decade that really changed that picture and that was it was things like the merlin burrow scans that that correlated other scans and also reported on yeah there seems to be a metallic object down there and this isn't you know this isn't sort of crazy emerging science this is a, a legitimate company that ha is using technology that's been well established in defense and in in the uk defense it came out of the the uk military as a technology that's been more or less proven so and the guy that that tim Akers, rest in peace unfortunately he's, he's since passed but he uh you know what he said about this object like he's he is a credible guy to, to say this. He he doesn't draw conclusions about what it might be, but it's definitely, it's not wood, it's not stone, it's metal. It's not unlike other metal that he's seen, although he, they couldn't classify what exact type of metal it is. But he said, yeah, there is a, in this central atrium, because the labyrinth has multiple levels and it's, it's almost like you're imagine yourself standing in a shopping mall and, and you have that central atrium where you can see all these levels and it's like this big central chamber that connects to these multiple levels that's open. It's at least 40 metres long. It's really tall and in the centre of it is what's well, more than 40 because it contains this single sort of 40 piece, 40 metre long object that's sitting in there. So how did you find out about the Labyrinth? Like, th this is something that has been talked about for a long time. Thousands of years. Yeah, but n no one, it's not in any, like, traditional archaeology books. It's not It so is. Is it? Yeah, yeah. No, it is. So the Labyrinth is kind of, the, this is the other part that drew, that drew me to it, uh, is that it isn't something that's coming out of left field, right? It's it's not like this, oh, no one ever heard of this before. It, it's literally a structure that was written about extensively over hundreds of years in antiquity by authors like Herodotus, Diodorus Siculus, Pliny the Elder, Strabo, Polonius Mello. Like there's there's all of these, these writers of antiquity, and you're talking about time frames from like 500 BC up to the first century AD, oh. had visited it and they'd, they'd written about it and talked about it and they gave it this legend being like guys like Herodotus said that it surpasses the pyramids in grandeur, and then you have, yeah. So this is the this is from Herodotus's histories in the fifth century BC, and he says, "For this I saw myself, and I found it greater than words can say. For if one should put together and reckon up all the buildings and all of the great works produced by the Hellenes, the Greeks, they would prove to be inferior in labor and expense to this labyrinth." So he's he's saying that. All of the temples of the Greeks, of ancient Greece, you've been there, you've seen yeah. the, the Acropolis, and just if you added them all up, the labor to produce them would be inferior in what it would take to just make this one thing in Egypt, the labyrinth. That is underground. That's underground, right. How do conventional archaeologists approach this? Do they discuss this at all? Yeah, so they do. It's, it's been discussed. It what happened was, so you had... They always, we always kind of knew where it was. So, you know, you have the the classical authors of antiquity, which coincides with what you might call the Ptolemaic period of ancient Egypt. It's the transition from di like dynastic Egypt into becoming essentially a, a Roman province, like an imperial province of Rome, and that runs you up to about you know four, four or five hundred AD, and then sort of you know civilization has. We have the Dark Ages, sort of have Roman Empire collapses, and it's not until again you get to the Renaissance and you, you have uh, artists and other authors are looking at these historical accounts and they're talking about it, they're drawing it. Some of the depictions you see from the labyrinth are in that. And then again, not until the emergence of what I would call modern archaeology in the 18th century. So guys like Carl Lepsius in the 1700s started to look at these accounts and go and, and survey the place where they said it was. So, it, you know, Herodotus and these authors, I, I selected the quotes here to just, there's a lot more that they say about it. But one of the things they talk about is they kind of give descriptions of where it is. They say it's near what was called Lake Moiris. 
and um, and it's near the what uh, a, a city that was the the temple of the crocodiles, Crocod- Crocodilopolis, or or ancient Arsino is the other name for it. And we know where that is. And Lake Moira sort of somewhat still exists. It's much smaller now, but it's in this region called the Fayum of Egypt. So if you ever look at Egypt on a map, you can imagine it's desert, and you have from north to south, you have this green line of the Nile, traces it down. But on the left side, you look at there's this leaf-shaped depression that's all green. It's called the Fayum. It's a depression which used to flood with the Nile. Today, they use it for agriculture. And it's right at that neck of the Fayum where it connects up to the Nile Valley, and he also described it. They also described the pyramid that's at the site because there is a, the pyramid to Amenemhat the third on that site. So they give us all these descriptors, and everyone kind of agreed. Yeah. So it's at this place called Hawara, where I've been to several times. There's still a pyramid there, and there's these great fields of sand and and, and like op- little open air libraries with chunks of stone. And what happened was, so Carl Lepsius went there, and he said, "Well, I've discovered the ruins of like a Roman town that's built on the surface. There's nothing crazy about it." Flinders Petrie was the guy who kind of got the closest. Now, Petrie went there in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and he was excavating. He dug down seven or eight meters. He got down, and he found this massive stone slab of, of beton or plaster that was huge, like a 1,000 feet long. Like it was his, He sort of traced the edges of it, and he's like, I'm standing on the foundation of the labyrinth. So what he said, he's like, it's all gone. Like it's basically, Petrie said, it's been quarried, this place has been a source of stone for literally millennia. So it's gone. So pretty much everyone since then in archaeology, Egyptology is like, and if you look on Wikipedia, they'll tell you, oh, it's, it's gone. It was destroyed. It was quarried away. Petrie says, you know, I'm standing on the, the foundation of it, the bottom layer, and that's it. It's, there's nothing here. And so that's always been kind of the position of orthodox Egyptology, look in the textbooks, that's where it is. But that's all changed because there's been a whole bunch of different now scientific expeditions there this is where it gets into some intrigue because the the, the Matahar expedition the Kara University expedition I mean these these happened their results have come out since but they were covered up at the time they were suppressed so the first guy to what re- year was this 2008 was the Matahar expedition they were covered up yes yeah so what was what this I, our boy Zawi yeah Zai, it is Zai. sorry it I was and look Zawi. and again not my words this is the words of Louis de Cordier who was he's a Belgian artist and entrepreneur who who funded and drove the Matahar expedition he did it in conjunction with the Supreme Council of Antiquities which at the time was helmed by Zahi Huas also with the NRIG which is the uh, National Research Institute for like um like basically subsurface studies so that's those guys dragging that box around. So they used a whole bunch of different techniques to look at these areas around that pyramid at the site of Huara, things like ground penetrating radar, geomagnetism, very low frequency, like seismic tomography, electrical resistivity tomography. There's a, there's a bunch of different techniques that are well-established. Known science, this isn't like the Kafra scan stuff where it's like you can debate the, the merits of the technology. This is established technology. And they found the labyrinth. So... And what he found was, is that, yes, so what Lepsius said about the ruins of a Roman or Greek or Persian town with mud bricks and stuff, yep, that's there in the first few meters. You go down, then you hit the water table. So that's the other issue on this site is the water table. So the water's at like five meters below the surface. And under that is the slab that Petrie found. So like six, seven meters is is at that that huge slab that, that Petrie found that he thought was the foundation. And then below that, Petrie didn't dig deep enough. Below that, we can find essentially a labyrinthian structure of granite and very, very dense rocks uh, and walls and, and, and um, like a maze-like structure that's, that has walls that are meters thick. There's another great slide in there that's, that's the green and it's the actual VLF front. That's it there. So, yeah, so this is at eight meters with VLF sounding. So you can see like this labyrinthian structure of these walls and all of these lines and walls. So these are like granite. And the scale of this, it's 100 meters vertically by 150 meters 100 meters tall well no so if, vertically no no so the the, the y-axis i guess of this so we're looking down in the oh, ground here I but see. you got to look at the scale like across the top that's 150 meters right so i mean what 450 feet so these are big walls these so are it's big chambers and big walls for people at home it's like a football field yeah it's a football yeah. field uh, well it's more i mean 100, more. 100 meters I mean, is... in australia it's my 100 meters is the football field i think i don't know how big yeah, it's, well, it's 100 here. yards. What is the difference between 100 yards and 100 meters? It's 100 yards is a little less. A little less. So 150 meters, and, and this is only a section of the labyrinth. They, they scanned two sections 
Uh, the labyrinth itself is said to be much, much larger than this. They, so they found... Much larger than that. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, no, it's... it's, it's it, what it is extends, the overall structure? Like, what, it's how, like a thousand feet at least. Wow. Like like three, three, four, five times that size. I mean, you have to go back to the... We, we have some better indication with the more modern space-based scans now, but when they did those, the geophysical, like the, the ground-penetrating radar scans, so they scanned two areas. That was the bigger one, like in front of the pyramid. Then they did another one on the other side of the canal that runs through the site today, and they found... They found it on both sides. So that's the difference between like what we say about the lab, like what the textbooks will tell you about the labyrinth, it not being there and it, it being destroyed too. No, we've actually, now there's been the Matahar expedition confirmed it was there. And they, so what happened, this was interesting. And I, I have, I have, I think reasoning for why this happened, it, but it was covered up. And these are the words like Louis de Cordier, he eventually got sick of waiting because what happens in Egypt, anything you do, whether it's you're, you're an academic institution or you're an individual or a group that's funding some sort of expedition, you work with the Council of Antiquities today, it's the um, Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. But they essentially, you know, you got to, it takes years to get ex access. And then once you do, though, they control release of information. So that's always part of the deal, right? It's that Egypt gets to do the announcing and if and when they choose. And they have dismissed things in the past yes. that they then accepted later. Yeah, a great example is the honestly the the Scan Pyramids project. So when so they got ahead of themselves a little bit. This is the the muon detection, the cosmic ray detection stuff. They've been running that experiment for years at, the, at Giza in the Great Pyramid. They put the and every time I go in there, there's always different sets of equipment at different places on it. But these muon detectors, they, they have them under the ground and in the ground gallery, and it just takes years to collect data. Occasionally, these cosmic particles. They'll pick one up, and it's you're able to detect voids, or you know, they have a, they can somehow tell the difference between it, it traveling through solid matter versus a void. It takes years to build up a, a resolute picture, but once they did, they said, "Oh, okay, so we've discovered that big void in the pyramid." But they'd also discovered the small void at the at the main entrance. If you if you look up at it today, there's those chevron blocks, like above. You, you go in down here at the Al Mamun's tunnel, but at the top where the descending passage actually exits the pyramid, the original entrance, there's these big chevron blocks. And behind that's that chamber. So you remember a few years ago, they made a big fuss. But and as an example, like when the, when the Scan Pyramids guys on their own initiative announced that we've made these discoveries, I mean, Zahi, Zahi basically came out and said, this is bullshit. This doesn't exist. There's nothing there. And if there is something there, we knew about it already. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you go on a couple of years, and when now it's time to do the press releases and to roll out, um, you know, the footage. And he's who's standing at the at the podium making the announcement and showing the footage. Zahi's doing it. Like he has to. Yeah. Yeah. I, Fascinating I, situation over there with him. Uh, yes, I, I I did a video. I just released it a few days ago that got into some even more intrigue about stuff that's happened at Giza in the in the in the at the Giza Plateau in the 1990s, which we can we can get into that too, but. So yeah, what happened with the Matahar expedition and the labyrinth was that 2008 and nine they finished their um, their on-site work. They're ready to release the data. They they put on a very small public lecture at Ghent University in Belgium. No one really attended it, and then they got told to stop. And again, in the words of Louis de Cordier, because he waited like two or three years and then he put this out there, he said that he was told to cease any and all discussion or release of information from the Matahar project and him and his team members were threatened with national security sanctions Oy. from Egypt, which means that, you know, I, I think at the low level, like if you come to Egypt, we'll arrest you. And if not, when maybe we'll come and get you. I don't know. It's, it's, it's national security sanctions. Isn't was, there a way the to sort of massage that situation and to talk to Zahi and say, listen, you can be the guy who found this. Oh, I, that would have been the case. I think that was a given if if it had been released. I actually think in the case. So, it's funny. I I I kind of don't really blame him. So much. I think this was a political uh, decision, not a not. So, and, you know, people say, "Oh, it's hiding the truth and whatever." Yeah, okay, that that's happening. There's new data. There's an amazing, amazing find that that could change the world. In my opinion, honestly, the labyrinth is the biggest archaeological discovery of the millennium. When we get into what that structure is and how big it is and the way it's reported in antiquity, there's nothing bigger than like Herodotus says it surpasses the pyramids. Like it's like finding more geese like a Giza plateau somewhere. Like under the ground. Under the ground. Like you can't I just think it would be the biggest discovery of the millennium, which is part of the problem. 